Hello, everyone, and welcome to our VistaTech uh, Life Sciences in Focus podcast. Fascinating conversations with global life sciences experts. This is a space where we interview life sciences people experts once a month, and I'm your host, Karen Katchik. So today we have a marvelous guest, Eliana Rivera Burke, global head at Greenlight Clinical, a long time sales leader in the clinical trial space, and perhaps most importantly, uh, an advocate who, for those who don't have a voice. Eliana and I connected at an online networking event and realized that we live only a few miles apart here in the uh, in the Denver metro area in Colorado. So we get to socialize in the real world. And that's enough for me. We want to hear from Eliana. Let's dive in and start with introductions. For those who don't know you, please tell, welcome, and please tell the audience a little about your background and your current role. Well, good morning, Karen, and thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm quite honored to be here. And um, just from a perspective of exposure, thank you, because I think these types of things are important. Uh, my background, I have been in the CRO world for about 27, almost 28 years, and started out very, very long time ago before the CRO world was as big as and as strong as it is now and as relevant. I had the privilege of working for one of the original thought leaders in that space and learned from that individual. And to this day has been a tremendous mentor to me in my life and also in my career. And I'm currently the global head of client engagement, which covers a whole lot of things, including business development, marketing, business operations, and a whole lot of other things, as I said, uh, for Greenlight Clinical. It's an Australian-based CRO. And we are focused in certain therapeutic areas, but I don't want this to be a sales pitch. This is more about, this is why I'm here and this is how I got here. So thank you. I really am honored to be here this morning. Well, it's my pleasure to have you. Um, you talk about being a patient advocate. How did you come to be that patient advocate? I survived. No. So I decided because of that, that it was my duty to be a voice, to speak, to say yes when you could and why not when others were telling you. So at the ripe old age, and I use that term very loosely, of 39, I was told I had breast cancer. It had not been historically in my family at all, no previous uh, cases of it. it. There was cancer, yes. Um, sadly, my mom had passed away from it as a result of cancer and other individuals. And it was an interesting journey because no one wanted to believe that, you know, a 39-year-old, you know, from a, from a cultural perspective, I'm, I'm from a Latin background, and it just wasn't really it wasn't really noticed. It wasn't really given the sort of the attention. So I had to fight to get a mammogram. I had to pay for it. And then when it was positive, all of a sudden things changed. And that put me on my journey. It was a it was an interesting journey. It gave me the opportunity to to at 39 take a look and go, what am I doing? Why am I here? And part of it is is that I want to be a voice. And then unfortunately, two years ago. I was diagnosed with melanoma, which 33% of breast cancer survivors are more susceptible to. So to hear it twice, to hear it once is, is hard. Hear it twice, it's for me, it was a number of things. An aha moment, you gotta do more. And the second thing is, uh-uh, this isn't gonna take me. So I'm here. You know, Ugh. and I've had, I have an amazing, amazing, and I, I try not to tear when I think of the medical team that has brought me here, that has kept me alive and will continue to keep me alive. Uh, one physician, my surgical oncologist said, yeah, we're not going to let you go yet. So I said, okay. I, I think, I pre the same as Dr. Babcock. I said, I appreciate that. He goes, no you are the one type of patient and he said this to me that 
want others to learn about what you can do for yourself to educate yourself, to ask questions, not necessarily to go to social media, but to go and ask questions of other patients, not, you know, necessarily just, uh, you know, a digital platform. But yes, that's viable because he doesn't disagree with that. But he says, you know, you've talked to our patients. You're willing to get on the phone with someone for a half hour. And he's asked me to do that, of course, with their consent and mine. But and that's that sheds a whole new light. You know, I don't see a cancer patient. I see a survivor when I speak to people. I see a survivor of whatever. Um, I've survived cancer twice. I don't know what's ahead, but I'm good. You know, throw something else at me. I'll be fine. <laughs> so oh. that's how I got started. And that's how I continue. Um, when I say throw something else at me, you never know what life is going to give you. But right. for whatever it is, I'm not, I, I don't, the word cancer to me was fear, was another word for fear. And having watched my mother, um, you know, pass away from it, was like, was that going to be how I am? And it wasn't, and it isn't. So I'm very grateful for everyone who has stepped up and who has helped me. And you have to step up for yourself. Thank you for sharing that. It's a very powerful, powerful story. And we'll talk more. We'll come. How do you, how do you bridge that personal passion that you have that that you exude with of what you do every day working at a clinical research organization? I've had. I said before, aha moments, and um, yeah. they're, they're kind of cliche, but not for me. When I have them, I feel them. It's not just like, oh, aha. No, I feel them. And I spoke before a group a very long time ago in Las Vegas, a uh, uh, cancer survivors group, specifically to a group of breast cancer survivors. And I asked a few people in the audience to tell me when they realized that they were going to be fine. And a few stood up and told their story. And it was part of what I was talking about. And I felt it. My feet felt it. My legs felt it. I, my, I was like, oh, this is just, you know, for me, this is real. This is a human. This is not written. This is spoken. This is heart. And when I have touched on things in my 27 years, certain drugs that have come to fruition, certain things you touched, you know, 20 years ago, that yes. now is helping individuals, that now yes. is touching the lives of individuals. And you go, I touched that. We did a phase one in this. We did a phase two in this. I remember reading about this. We did the regulatory. We did this. And you think, wow, that that takes me, the cancer patient, the cancer survivor, into a different realm because you now know that maybe getting up at 4 a.m. for a call or going to bed at 4 p.m. to get up at midnight for a call is well worth the effort. And that's the bridge. That bridge is a powerful bridge in respects that scientists and researchers today that are making a difference are doing it because they know it's necessary. It's not always about when's the next billion billion dollar blockbuster. You know, a lot of discoveries we've made in this industry have been by mistake. You know, you you think, oh, you know, I, I had the privilege of working on an orphan drug, which was actually, and this was many years ago, which was a drug that was used for something else, but ended up helping patients that had Tourette's. And I watched the the evolution of that medication for these patients and how their Tourette's symptoms decreased and they felt normalized. Because I think when we, one of the things that patients and, and we think we're alone, we're not. Because the moment you put yourself out there and you're vulnerable and you say it, help me. Um, like I said, with my physician, Dr. Babcock, 
He's asked me to talk to patients and I'm open and I'm willing, but that requires you to open yourself up as well. Not only them, but yourself. And to watch, like I said, this orphan drug help Tourette's because we saw videos of the symptoms decreasing over time. And this was a very long time ago, but boy, did that ever just impact me. And that's why there's that bridge. I know what's coming. It gives us hope. Um, for some, it may be all you have, unfortunately. Marvelous. Thank you. No, you, 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 you. You explained that so clearly and so, um, yeah, con with conviction, it, it convicts me. Um, let me ask you a little about um, equity and accessibility. So it feels you've, you've described yourself as a Latina, right? You're a mm -hmm. bilingual person, aren't you? You're a Spanish-English bilingual Spanish, person. Spanish-English, and when I can, Japanese, but it doesn't sound very good, so we're fine. <laughs> okay. So it feels to me that we've come along leaps and bounds, relatively speaking, in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the past five years, say, since the pandemic. Yet there's still a very long way to go. What's your take, Alice? You know, I think that there are certain populations that even the standard of care doesn't reach, which is a very sad statement. And I think the other side of that is, is that research, it starts at times in research. It starts at times with opening up the doors and going to populations and areas of certain cities, for example. You know, some of the populations of big cities like Denver or LA or New York or Baltimore and opening up those doors and being able to include them in. And for some, it might be the only care that they've ever gotten. And they don't, they may have a disease, they don't have a way to treat it. Um, I worked for a CRO that actually put a program together a very long time ago that for diabetes patients in underserved areas that just would not have access. No, they didn't have transportation, they were very poor, but they weren't being treated for diabetes. And Nurses went out and did, they gave them tablets, they gave them their sensors, they gave them diabetes medications, they gave them ways to communicate, and some people survived because of it. And that, for me, is important. And from a Latina perspective, my experience at 39 and being told, Latinas don't get breast cancer. What? Well, I'm... I am. <laughs> I'm a Latina. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, hello? A and, well, that's just very rare. Okay, so you go from very rare to confirming that I now have it. So where else are we missing? You know, and I had an experience some time back to go out and talk to a, a mostly Latino population of women and men. There were some men, and it was specifically about breast cancer testing. And they never, some of these women were in their 60s. Some of these women were in their 50s. There was a handful in their 30s. They never have a member. So when you say go out, are you talking about going into a, going into going a part into of a, a town? Go into in a, a part of a population and they do, they do a digital broadcast of this is coming. There's a, a mammogram bus and there's nurses, et cetera. <clears throat> And they mostly are bilingual. I also act, so not only do I speak, but I also act as a translator. So I can, I speak our language. I speak research and medical in Spanish as well as English. So they, I can, I, what I try to do my best, and sometimes I, I have to think about it, is how do I translate that medical potential that might instill some fear into a layman's term to say, this is really what you should do. This is good for you as you move forward. This is a way to figure out if you do, because some of them may have had symptoms or lumps, right. uh, et cetera. And so it's it, it, from that perspective, the other side of that is that you're helping them overcome a certain, well, a wall. I mean, there's a wall. They're just, they're, it's fear. It's, and I always say, what I say to them always is, you should be more fearful of not knowing versus knowing. Knowing you know what to do. 
not knowing, you don't know what to do. For me, I had, my body was very weird. Was I was feeling weird symptoms. I had a very visible lump. Um, I, I was, you know, I would be like, you know, okay, this is just, something wasn't right. So I was willing to take that step. It took a while, by the way, because I resisted it. Um, but then I thought, I really need to check this out. And I went and, as I said, and I was, when I, it may not be the answer I wanted, it was the answer that I got, and it was the answer that I dealt with and moved my life forward with. And I don't view myself as a, I view myself as a survivor, not as a, as a cancer patient. I'm a cancer survivor. And that's the message that I like to put out there is that you have you know, you can get the care that you need. And even in, 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 in sectors of this country that just have no access to it. Uh, and there is that, you know, you think it's the United States. No, there are still people who don't get care. And that sometimes is parts of the world where not necessarily we want to go to. Uh, and I got, I've gone. You know, I've gone. I opened the door. I opened myself up. I'm very willing to do that. And I think it's important uh, that we include. I think diversity is important. I also think diversity gives you a lot of good data in what we do of on course. a daily basis, you know, culturally. Yeah. Um, and you, certain people react a certain way, certain people react another way. Uh, one of the things I agreed to was genotyping testing. I was a patient at Stanford at the time. And I agreed to genotyping testing to see if there, maybe there is another population out there. That was a very long time ago, but I know I'm sure hopefully that helped in some way, shape or form. We'll see. Yep. And you speak about, I mean, you're living in the United States of America and you're speaking about the most spoken language other than English, right? You're talking about yes. being a Spanish, the Spanish going yes. into the Latino communities. What's it like for everyone else? Good grief, right? If it's that exactly. bad, yeah. Yep. Unfortunately. And the cultural, yes. some some cultures have the shame of, right? There's, there's they cultural don't embrace. pieces. Right, yes. they don't embrace. They don't embrace. Um, I had a conversation with a member of my family who is probably mid-50s, having some symptoms. And she called me, okay. And I said, you, it sounds like you may not necessarily, she's thinking of the worst, right? That's also a cultural thing. It's like, I'm gonna die. No, not very um, But, and it turned out that she doesn't have cancer. She's got something else. She's got um, some form of like, uh, uh, it's like a continuous, um, stomach thing. I don't know if it's her or her about, but she had all of these symptoms and she was just very fearful. And so she goes, you've had cancer. Yes, I have. And your sister had cancer. Did she have this? Yes, because my sister is a colorectal cancer survivor. And she went through uh, her own rigor and is now on the other side of it. But she was told she wasn't going to survive. So my cousin was feeling the same way. Again, two Latina women, right? And, I, and it turned out she had something else. And my, what I said to her was, aren't you better knowing right you 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 addressed it or you confronted it however you want to do it you didn't let that fear of oh, i just don't want to know because that's culturally what we do we don't want to know and that's really very relevant today and it's 2024 it was relevant a long time ago it's still relevant today and now she's glad she knows and you know my sister for a very long time thought she had something else and found out that she didn't. She yeah. had stage four colorectal. She yeah. survived it. She survived it. You know, she did what she had to do. And I just saw her a week and a half ago. She's doing fine. But the other part of that too is she has survived it. And then she's stayed on top of it because it's really doesn't end. You can be declared regularly that you're cancer free. And I think that's also important address it, you know, confront it, address it, get care for it, and stay on, stay on it. Make sure that you continue to 
do whatever the care is. If they suggest certain changes, do that for yourself. Do that for your family. Do that for your well-being. You've been in, so you've been in clinical research for nearly, uh, nearly 30 years, right? Long time. Is there anything going on today that gives you hope, that inspires you, that we're making uh, progress? I look at what's going on with CAR T. I look mm -hmm. at, at mRNA. I look at the progress being done from vaccines. I look at just the fact that there could even be potentially be a vaccine for cancer or certain forms of cancer or AIDS or the long-term CAR-T. For me, Karen, that's hope. I may not be here to see some of the developments. I mean, I'd like to think I can be. I may be a little bit more forgetful, but I think I'll remember and go, I talked to Karen about that on March 4th, 2024. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but I think the part of part of that part of what you're seeing today is what we can do to make a difference in not only the standard of care of of wherever you live of the populations because this isn't just about the U.S. This is global, and we if I think one of the things that the pandemic taught us is that when we do something together, we can make greater progress. Um, on my LinkedIn profile, I have a saying, it says, juntos somos más, together we are more. And I believe that. I live that because I believe, you know, when I'm, when I'm, uh, I was, I was literally last week confronted with an indication, which I never really had a lot of experience on. And I called my mentor, one of my mentors and said, can you help me understand what this is? And he talked to me for about 20 minutes and it was a lot more enlightening than reading anything highly complicated online uh -huh. and having that individual that I could reach out to. He's a, he's a former practicing physician. He was an oncologist and he also was a researcher for a good part of his life. And so he has this great wealth. But I think when I look at that and I think I'm reaching out to one person, imagine if our respective researchers just reached out and, you know, talked. And that's where for me, that's where I get I get hope. I feel like we can we can overcome certain things. We may not necessarily cure, but what we absolutely can do is improve the quality of life of those that may have something with them. We might be able to go in a more preventative mode with vaccines, or if not prevent, if you do get it, you don't get it as bad. You know, it's certain like you know, flu vaccines. I got my flu vaccine and uh, we were at a family wedding. Everyone got the flu except for me and my husband. We're like, yeah. we had sniffles. We still have sniffles, but we're like- You're yeah, we feeling like, I told you so. You're feeling a bit <laughs> smug, are you? Right. <laughs> just, uh, just a little bit. Just but a I, smidge but, smug. Right. smug. <laughs> but I think those, I think those, that, that progress is not just for us, it's it's for everyone. It's for our future. It's for you have children, for for their children, for your grandchildren, and for their children. It's what we leave for those that are here now. You know, I don't. I never had a child. I have a stepson, and I always say, I and he's like one time he asked me, why do you do this? And I said, because I want to leave you a better world. And he goes, yeah, okay, I get it. Okay, I get it. Okay, you know, mind you, I think he was in his 20s at the time. He's not anymore, but but he, I think, you know, he just, he sees me working and driving, you know, like just driving myself. And and sometimes I've missed out on certain things. And I try not to do that the way I used to, you know, that was a much longer time ago. But now I try to balance it. You know, I try to create that balance where if I'm working and I see stuff and it's something that really drives me, yeah, I'm still going to do it. I want to get it done. Um, right. And I've seen some breakthroughs. I'm currently working in ophthalmology and some of the things in ophthalmology that are happening give me great hope mm -hmm. for the fact that, you know, we're aging. <laughs> I am, you're not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you just kind of, you just kind of go, well, one of the first things they say to go is your vision. Well, uh-uh. 
not if I have anything to say about that. And that's been, you know, Greenlight does a, a lot of ophthalmology and, and oncology, but to see the progress and with ophthalmology, you see it quicker. Vaccines, you see it quicker. Um, and and I think, you know, I read an article about a researcher working on M mRNA, and he was saying how what they're doing could change how, you know, how long-term illnesses could maybe not be prevented 100%, but not be something that is as prevalent as it is now and i thought that was just you know that's from a researcher that's from the heart i think that's from the heart that's a hard thing researchers that right. research with their heart they usually find answers you know, right they spend heart a lot of time with the heart in the lab yeah i think his mantra was heart mind and lab well can't argue with that no, you can't. want him to be working on your uh yeah. Your indication, don't you? Yes, you please. Want, you want yes, people like that. Absolutely, yes. And he won a, a Nobel Prize, and I thought that was very well deserved. So. <clears throat> so, before we wind up this lovely conversation, um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? You know, I think one of the one of the things, and I share. Um, I share my sister's story about access and I share her, I share her, I share the fact that we were told, I mean, I got a phone call. I was at ASCO, uh, ironically, you know, the oncology, you know, the network of oncologists, 40 plus thousand people average, that I was told she had cancer and that she probably wouldn't see Christmas and that was June. And I picked up the phone and I called a friend, uh, my friend who's, He's a, he's a an amazing oncologist in Florida. Uh, his name is Julio. And I said, Julio, help. He told me what to do. I did it. My sister got into a treatment program. And the doctor that said she wouldn't see Christmas, it was the happiest day of my life that I got to say, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was in 2007. Yeah. So you helped your sister get the access to the next level of care? Access to be given broader answers, not just, go. not just, yeah. this is, this was one humans, which I have, I, I respect that that's how he felt. Yes. But I think in, in opening up the doors and building those bridges, you get a better edge you get a greater level of education your mind opens up about certain things and for her that's what it was about because i do remember i mean we went we flew there we got on the plane this might be her last christmas you know what are we going to do you know you just you just all of these things you you you're like you're you're in turmoil you know you're in turmoil and it's not about it. And I wasn't in turmoil. I was in part in turmoil for myself to lose a sibling, potentially to lose a sibling, but in turmoil for her, because I'm watching her be very confused about what to do. And I think when you when you open the doors and you have accessibility to answers and you have someone who truly understands to a certain degree what you're going through whether it's a case manager, patient advocate, or a fellow survivor, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to call what, what a lot of people are out there doing and groups are doing, it's really to help you come along. Whether you come along ultimately and you survive, amazing and a blessing. And if you don't, you're not alone. And for me, it's about how can I help you whoever it is that I'm speaking to. And I'm speaking to someone in, in 30 minutes, another individual who has asked to speak to me. And I said, I'm happy to do that. And they were very concerned about, you're very busy. Nope, never too busy. And I think part of what, what science is doing, what research is doing, what you and I spend our lives, our work lives doing, is creating a time when we may have more hope. We may have more answers. I mean, hope... <laughs> Everybody says hope isn't a strategy. It's worked for me. Um, 
but hope is answers, you know, and, and answers are, are hope and education and someone to hold your hand or someone to listen to you, cry with you, uh, scream with you. I had two story. I, <laughs> I had a young girl whose dad was diagnosed with a rare form of, uh, of brain cancer and they could not break, they couldn't do anything. And somehow we happened to be in the same doctor's office and we're talking and she was there for herself. She goes, I really feel like I should be checked out. I'm like, okay, I understand that. And she was fine. It ended up, she was fine, but she was so afraid of not knowing what was really going on with her dad. And I said, there's organizations that will help you. There's support groups. Uh, your dad should probably also consider it. And um, she went into the ladies room and I heard her go, Woo! like, I'm like, is she okay? Did she hit her head? She goes, I said, are you all right? She goes, she comes out. She goes, I just woot woot for you. Thank you. No. And I did. And I went, she goes, yeah, I did a woot woot for you. I'm like, okay. And that made me feel like I probably spent three and a half, maybe four minutes of my time in the scale of a day of 24 hours but this was someone who I'd never met. I, we ended up, we text. Um, she said, you, you, you did something for me. And I think what we do is the, the part of that that carries on to the rest. And that's why you. you work early in the morning and I work early in the morning and late at night. But I'm also very driven by the fact that research can help save lives and improve lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliana, for sharing how the personal and the professional have combined to make you the person you are today. Oh, thank and, you. And, uh, and to our audience, <clears throat> I have no doubt, but that this, I mean, this, how could this not inspire you hearing such a powerful, uh, powerful story? Um, this podcast, this life sciences in focus. Po I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm struggling to come back to the ground. This life sciences in focus podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you live, your lead your lives into your podcasts, as well as on YouTube if you wish to watch it. Um, thank you again to our wonderful guest, Eliana. And please make sure to tune in again next month for Vista Tech Life Sciences in Focus fascinating conversations with global life sciences experts. Honored to be here. Never give up hope.